So today we'll talk about some uh, ion torrent workflows. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a, um, a de novo assembly of a microbial genome, and I'll show a project setup and uh, as well as some gap closure uh, on some of the contigs. So I know quite a, quite a few folks that have contacted us recently or were interested in that particular workflow. And then we'll kind of switch gears and look at a targeted resequencing. This will be an Ampliceat cancer uh, panel. Um, and we'll set up one of those projects and uh, go through the assembly and analysis. Um, but first, I'll give you a little bit of background um, on our company, DNA Star. Um, we are located in Madison, Wisconsin. We have uh, a nice picture here. I always like to point out this is the summer, Lake Monona in the capital. Uh, it's covered with ice yet in April, which is a rarity, but it's been very cold here this spring. Uh, hopefully it'll look like this in a couple of weeks. Um, but it, it's, uh, Madison, Wisconsin is centrally located uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, we have sales and marketing and our developers and scientific staff here. Uh, and it's, it's really a nice resource to be centrally located so our customers uh, can really receive the top-notch support. So if they have questions or have input um, on software development, um, I have a direct line of communication with the development team, so it really uh, is, a, is a nice situation. Our background um, uh, goes back quite a ways. Uh, we, we've been a pioneer in uh, genomics. Our founder is Dr. Frederick Blattner, who was the first to sequence the E. coli genome. Uh, this is back in the 1990s. A number of the people on this science paper are still with the company in, in different capacities, uh, and, and, and really that's been an area of expertise for us, um, uh, working with microbial genomes and doing assembly and annotation work. Uh, and, and so we've really been a leader in this field since uh, you know the 1980s. And we, we focused on desktop computing solutions um, and providing uh, powerful tools for researchers so that they can handle their own data, run their own assemblies, do their own analysis. Uh, we are going to be expanding soon uh, to a cloud, so we'll have some additional options for people that would like to do their analysis uh, up in the cloud. Uh, our software really is research grade, uh, so people use the software um, and then publish with it. And so dating back to 1985, um, DNA Star has been the most frequently cited uh, software um, for um, bioinformatics uh, for over 25 years. And so you can see this is a, a long history of producing powerful, well-supported software uh, for scientists. And so uh, our software that we'll look at today will be some SeqMan Engine assembly software, as well as some downstream analysis tools in some of our other programs. Our SeqMan Engine assembly software runs on 64-bit Mac, PC, and Linux. Uh, we assemble all different platforms. Today we'll talk about Ion Torrent, um, but we are agnostic to platforms. So we can assemble uh, data from other uh, platforms as well. The analysis tools are, are primarily going to be in SeqMan Pro and ArrayStar. For those of you that are already DNA Star customers, you may already have access to the SeqMan Pro module, which we'll spend a good amount of time in today. Uh, the capacity is high. Uh, we can do multiple human genomes. Um, concurrently, uh, for analysis, we can do assemblies of you know, multiple exomes or very, very large projects, um, and the cost is low. So for, for under $5,000, you can get both the assembly and analysis software. And of course, the support is webinars like we're doing today um, are, are frequently done um, both one-on-one -on -one and in groups. So if you have a project that um, isn't quite what we're doing today, something that's you know, maybe a, a little bit different variation. We can certainly set up a webinar with you, um, work through your project. You, you can um, ask questions, you know, and we can have more of a flexible format um, to go through your workflows. And, and, and so that's the kind of support that we provide with the software that really is a distinction amongst you know, open source or other commercial competitors is that, is that you, know, you can call us, email us, set up webinars, and we can provide that, that kind of support. So one of the first questions that we'll get um, regarding um, our software is you know, how powerful is it? Um, you know, is it comparable with some of the open source programs that people have running on Linux clusters, for instance? And so I'd like to show some of the benchmarks. Now with ion torrent data, um, even with the proton data, set, uh, data sets, the data sets aren't that large. You know, they're, they're smaller to medium-sized data sets. And so they don't, really don't stress our software at all. So you know, things like the Ampliceat Cancer Panel, 
um, or we may have a few million reads. You know, that takes under 30 minutes. And this is a three-sample panel that we're, that we're running. So, you know, well under an hour assembly time. Smaller projects like the E. coli uh, genome, K12, um, may only take several minutes to do the assembly. Um, RNA-seq projects, uh, again, these can be highly variable. You could have 10 million reads, 100 million reads, um, all different sizes. Um, generally take an hour or two hours to do the assembly. So it's a very, very fast assembly time. Um, and again, these projects are done on a very reasonable computer. We just say it's a, a Dell computer that you can purchase for under $3,000. And if you are making hardware decisions now, if you're looking at software and hardware, you know, by, by all means, contact us um, with any hardware questions that you have, and we can just kind of double check and make sure that, you know, you're not buying more hardware that, that, than you need and, and making sure that you, of course, um, are getting enough hardware for the type of projects that you're doing. Uh, there's also de novo assemblies uh, with, with uh, ion torrent. We usually are doing um, uh, microbial genomes. And we have some metrics here. We get a really nice contagen 50 of you know, 88 um, KB. The assembly time is usually 30 minutes to an hour, somewhere in that range. Um, and, and really, the most important metric for de novo assembly is how accurate are the contigs. Um, I'd be willing to have a much longer assembly time if I knew that it's saving me hours or days of putting contigs together into scaffolds. And so that's some of the work that we'll look at today is just, you know, what do we do with the de novo assembly? How do we work with the contigs and DNA star software? And then take ion torrent data and, you know, close a genome and, and, and kind of complete that workflow. So, there, so there's a number of workflows that our software uh, support. Uh, I have a couple highlighted here, de novo genome and targeted resequencing. Um, there's also other workflows, RNA-seq and de novo transcriptome. Uh, with ion torrent folks, um, I'm seeing more de novo transcriptome in the last uh, several months, as well as things like 16S um, data sets uh, with ion torrent. Uh, maybe in the future we'll cover some of those additional workflows in another webinar. Uh, there's also an automated bacterial genome closure workflow uh, that I've uh, done a webinar uh, on uh, fairly recently. And then we also have genome resequencing. There's, there's other workflows, viral metagenomes, um, viral integration site, which is going to be a new workflow. So the, the software really becomes flexible to allow you to um, fit your workflow into one of the workflows that we have uh, set up in the software. So the starting point today then will be uh, kind of a de novo genome workflow. And I do have one, one more slide here. And so for those of you that, are, that, that have microbial genomes and you're thinking about a de novo assembly, uh, one of the first questions that you'll have is, um, is this a de novo project or do I have a reference genome that I can use that can help guide the assembly? And would that be an improved assembly over strictly a de novo approach? And oftentimes there's no clear answer to that uh, until you do both assemblies. And, and our software will allow you to do both very quickly, and then we can help customers decide, you know, what, it, what is the best approach. So in a de novo approach, um, we'll take the ion torrent data, and Seekman Engine will, will cluster the data into contigs. And uh, the contigs then um, can be ordered into scaffolds. And that scaffold then is a putative genome order. And if we have really nice clean data and we've trimmed it well, um, you know, we can get a whole genome in, you know, 25 to 100 contigs and then place those contigs in a scaffold. So that means you've got somewhere between 100, 100 and, and uh, 25 gaps that, that you'd need to close if you want to close your sequence strain. Um, I have an hour-long webinar from August 22nd. Uh, that focuses just on this workflow in more detail than, than we'll cover today. So you can go back to our website, you know, if you want to focus on this, you know, after this webinar and watch an hour long just on de novo genome assembly. Uh, if you have a reference sequence that is close, you may um, try our automated gap closure workflow where we use the reference sequence and Seekman Engine will that'll guide most of the assembly, but then there's differences um, due to insertions and deletions, um, where you need to do de novo assembly to resolve those areas. Um, it's a series of algorithms that will automatically identify those um, novel regions and then de novo assemble those novel regions and then close the gaps automatically. And if your reference is close enough, uh, you can actually get a very, very efficient closure. 
And you know, oftentimes, uh, by definition, you know, if your reference genome contains a hundred or fewer structural variants difference from your sequence strain, that's kind of the the, the range that we're looking at. Um, and and we can often reduce the number of contigs to some, in the very best cases, to one contig. But more frequently, it's a handful, a couple dozen contigs left over. So it can be a big improvement over strictly de novo. Again, there's another webinar that covers this topic um, in detail. Um, and, and so these are kind of the first first question that you would ask. Now, once once you've determined that, oh, I have to go de novo, my best reference doesn't really provide much, much of an advantage, um, then we can focus on the de novo approach. And that's kind of what we'll set up here today with some ion torrent data. So I have SeqMan Engine launched. SeqMan Engine is uh, what we're looking at now we call a wizard. And so it is an interface that allows us to set up a variety of different project types. It's meant to be as easy to use as possible so that by just using the default values that are provided, um, we should be able to get a really nice assembly. So, so that's the goal. Now, of course, there's many different uh, tricks and tips that I can provide um, to improve certain assemblies and to troubleshoot and make adjustments and we allow that as well. So the starting point here will be a, a new assembly project. And then you just click Next, and you choose the project type. In this case, it'll be a genome assembly. Click Next, and you can see we have four options here. Um, one option is a genome assembly where we generate a BAM file output, but the projects aren't editable. And this is the, this is the workflow that we choose if we're, we're aligning to a reference genome and we want to do SNP analysis. So a human genome, for instance, we're going to pick this workflow and look for the variants. Uh, then we have a de novo assembly that uses our de novo algorithm. Um, the, the, there is a capacity limit uh, here. It's, it's really determined by how much RAM you have available. So anytime you're doing a de novo assembly, it's very important to be cognizant of um, how much RAM your computer has and how much RAM you're using during the assembly. And, and if there's problems with the, with the data or with parameters, you might use more RAM than, than, than you should be. And, and again, that's an area that we can help with troubleshooting to uh, improve assemblies, reduce RAM, and get a, a great result. Then there's a couple of specialized workflows. There's the reference guided assembly with gap closure. Um, and again, if I have a new microbial strain, I'm going to try both of these approaches. Use my best reference and also do de novo look at the result and make my decision what, what, what I think is the path, path of least resistance to uh, closing my genome. And then we also have a special workflow for um, some other types of projects. So we'll stick with de novo. We name our project. We pick an output folder. All the output files will go to this folder. And then we can save the project. Um, typically, we're going to save as a Seekman format um, that's fully editable, so all the aligned reads and the consensus are editable. And, um, and that, that's the preferred format to work with. Uh, we also have a, an ACE file format. Um, ACE files, though, seem to be fading. Uh, they're, they're used less frequently. Um, they aren't very efficient with larger data sets, so I don't recommend using ACE in most instances. Uh, we also have a de novo BAM format. Um, and this is a format that, that DNA Star has developed and it doesn't allow us to edit, but it does allow us to create a much larger de novo assembly. Um, so if we have a larger project that has more than 10 million reads, um, and we have enough RAM to assemble it, we can build a really large de novo project in this BAM format. Uh, then we're asked to set up our sequence files and define our read technology. So we have a pull down where we can select the read technology. And we can then load files, and we distinguish between unpaired and paired reads. And so with uh, paired reads, I have some that are loaded here. I'm going to load another set. When I select paired reads, it will ask me for the insert size. And so I'm going to select 3,500 base pairs. And this is actually a data set that has one set of mate pairs at 9,000, the other at 3,500. It's not necessary to have mate pair data for a de novo assembly. So you might only have single end data. Um, and, and the majority of our Antarc customers have single end data at this point. There's relatively few that are using mate pair. However, there are advantages of uh, having mate pair data. You know, if, for instance, your intention is to fully close your genome, if you need to order all the contigs, 
close all the gaps, then MatePair data is very, very useful because you can use our software can use the MatePair information to automatically order the contigs. If I don't have MatePair data and I just have contigs, then I have more work to do just putting the contigs in the scaffold. I may have to align the contigs to a reference genome um, and, and manually assign the positions within the contig. So it becomes a little bit more challenging. In some cases, you don't need to close everything. You're only interested in a certain area of the genome. You just go with single end data and, and you're fine. We have some read options here. Again, we can stick with defaults primarily. Um, we have a quality end trimming that will be on by default, and I'll show that in a little bit more detail. We also have vector and adapter scans. And with de novo assemblies, it's very, very common to have leftover linkers or adapters or primers attached to some of the reads or all of the reads. And those can be very inhibiting on a de novo assembly. And in, in some cases, like de novo transcriptome, there's often cDNA linker sequences left over. And what, what I'll do in that case is I might do a pilot assembly. So I'm kind of diverging here on a different kind of a project. But very commonly with a de novo transcriptome, we'll do a real small assembly of the data, 100,000 reads or 10,000 of the reads. So we get a quick assembly, and then we look at it, and we look at the ends of the aligned reads, and we identify, oh, here's a linker that I thought was trimmed off, but it's still there. We figure out what it is. And then we set it up as a sequence. And here's some ion vector sequence that I had identified in one of these data sets. And I'll just put a clone site of one. So there's this little piece here. And I'm going to tell the, the program, look for this FASTA file that has this ion vector in it. And it will trim that very, very efficiently and rapidly, remove that. I'll get a much better, a, a much improved de novo assembly. Um, it'll use less RAM if I can clean up the data prior to the de novo assembly. So it's very important to clean the data as, as best as you can. Um, I won't go through all the advanced trimming options, but SeekMan Engine offers a really nice palette of different tools for trimming. And hopefully you don't have to try out all of them. But just to show you, we have quality trimming. These defaults have been optimized through many, many, many different ion torrent data sets. Um, but there is options like fixed end trimming. So if you have a tag or a linker that's 10 base pairs on every 5 prime end, you, know, you can remove that using a fixed end trim. We also use a quality score independent trimming called trim to mer. That's also very important for um, some of the ion torrent data. Uh, and then there's some additional uh, vector adapter scan parameters. I won't go through all of those. Um, now assembly options, here's some of the more basic parameters. I'm going to give the assembler a genome size so that it can help with the repeat handling. I'm going to stick with default MER size and match percentages. Um, however, if I do want to change one parameter um, from default, it would be the minimum match percentage. And this really sets the stringency of the assembly. If I run an assembly at 80%, I'll get a larger assembly but potentially more errors in it. If I really need the most accurate contigs, and I don't care as much about contig size, I might go a little above the default and assemble at 93 or 95%. I will get smaller contigs, but very less likely to have any false join or problems in the contig. So that's the one parameter that you might change. I also sometimes limit the number of small contigs that are saved out to the project. So oftentimes there's little tags and tiny contigs that aren't going to be useful for closure. And I might say, I really don't need any contigs less than 250 base pairs in length. Um, there's more advanced options, um, but I'm not going to go into those. They're rarely adjusted for a de novo genome. And then the assembly is ready to begin. So again, the wizard allows us, with de novo assembly, there's a few more options. So we pick our, our pathways, set up our files, um, set up a vector trim in this case stick with defaults, enter our genome length. And what's happening now is we're writing a script in the back end here. And that's what this uh, .script file is. It saves out to our folder. Um, this we can send to DNA star. You know, if you have, need some assistance, the script file is great. We can see you know, where there's a problem. You know, one common problem that folks will run into is that they have data files that are zipped up yet. And we can see it in the script. Oh, we didn't unzip one of these files. So, 
Um, so you can email that uh, this file to us. Um, the script file is also allows you to run this program from the command prompt. So if you have a need for higher throughput and you want to put multiple scripts together and run 20 assemblies overnight, you can make a master script to do that. So it allows a more uh, advanced user to have a, a, a higher throughput on their assemblies. And we click Assemble. And when I do a de novo assembly, I watch this log. All right, and if there's a problem here, we'll see some red errors, and we can export the log and again send that to DNA Star. I also always will have my activity monitor open, and it'll show up as SNG, and I can watch my RAM use. So I let the assembly run like this. Now this computer has 16 gigs of RAM. If I load enough data in for a microbial genome, if it's deep enough, you could potentially use 16 gigs of RAM. Typically, it's less than 8 gigs of RAM. Or if there's a problem with the data and it's not going together well, I could use more RAM. So you always want to watch the assembly. Once it runs out of RAM, it slows down tremendously. Um, and you really typically want to just restart the assembly, limit the input reads and a, a bit more, or add more RAM, try the assembly again. When this assembly is done, there will be a button to launch this, this project in Seekman Pro. And so I'm just going to quit here. Seekman Pro is one of the modules in the LaserGene core suite. Many of you are familiar with this core suite. There's many different modules that offer different functionalities, including protein analysis and basic sequence and sequence, uh, ed editing and annotation. Um, and so Seekman Pro is one of these modules. And so the idea here is that we can run our assemblies on you know, maybe our more powerful computer and do the downstream analysis on our laptops or our regular daily use uh, desktop machines. And so I do have a project open. So this is a, an ion torrent de novo E. coli genome assembly. And we'll start we'll focus on this first window here. And what this window is is a list of contigs. I've actually done one more step and what that is is I use the algorithm under project which is order contigs into scaffolds. Because this was mate pair data, this algorithm can run in two minutes and it'll look at all the mate pair data and it will place the contigs into scaffolds and give it a position number. And the position number is the numerical sequential order of the contig within that scaffold. And so um, it's typical to have several scaffolds for the entire genome, and each of those scaffolds contains several contigs. And if I don't have mate pair data, then I just have a list of contigs, and they'll all be under the unlocated bin. So here's some that were not placed in scaffold. If I don't have mate pair data, I have to figure out the positional information, you know, another way. And you know, one way might be to align the contig consensus sequences using a program like MOV to a reference genome, and then I can um, I can go in and assign manually. So I just clicked and held on the position column and I can put a number in and start making my own position and, and creating my own scaffolds. Here's a project create new scaffold and I can put contigs within that scaffold manually. That, that's a lot more work, but um, it's certainly something that many of our customers will do for, for some of their genomes. So I've done uh, use the mate pair data in our algorithm to automatically create scaffolds. If I need to close the gaps now, so if I want to close this genome, um, what I need to do then is focus on one gap at a time at this point. Actually, there's one more algorithm I could run, um, and I, I'm not going to run it here, but it's um, under contig, align contigs end to end. This is an aligner that looks within scaffolds and looks for overlap between adjoining contigs. And typically between about 5 and 10% of contigs, once they're in scaffolds, you're able to find some overlap in the ends and automatically merge them. Um, but it, it's a relatively small number. Um, at this point, it's, it becomes a manual process to figure out how to join contigs. And so I'm going to focus, and, and you can see there's a little box here, and I can lock the whole project down. And what that means is that if I add more data to this project um, and then assemble, it can't, that data cannot be placed in any of this locked, these locked contigs. And that's an important distinction because once you have your contigs placed in an order in a scaffold, you really want to maintain the integrity of that order. And you don't want to scramble contigs up or add a repetitive element and get one contig from one part of the genome, 
joined to a contact from a completely different part of the genome joined together by a repetitive element. So I want to maintain this position information, so I lock the whole project down, and then I can focus on two contigs at a time. And so if I want to look at contig 19 and 38, I can unlock them just by clicking on the lock symbol. And now it makes these two contigs open and available for adding more data to try to join them together. Now how to find that data, there's a number of different ways to find a potential piece of of DNA sequence that can join these two together. One way might be just to design primers, and you can send these consensus out to our primer design programs and get a set of PCR primers and amplify across the gap and generate an amplicon sequence and sequence that, and then bring that sequence in and um, merge these two contexts together. Um, typically, we try to do everything else before we get to that point where we have to design primers. Um, and so, if you're working with E. coli or many of the different microbes, oftentimes you can blast the edges of these contigs. And what I did here is I just double-clicked on the contig and highlighted about 200 base pairs on the trailing edge of this contig. And so what this looks like kind of in a strategy view. So this is, um, here's contig 19, here's contig 38. There's a little gap in between these blue um, marks below are the pairs that allowed us to put these contigs next to each other. And I'm just kind of scrolling through. And that's how SeqMan ordered these contigs next to each other. And I'm trying to resolve this gap. And so what I can do is double click, highlight a couple hundred base pairs, and then go to net search, blast. Now it takes a couple of minutes, so I did, I did that ahead of time. So I didn't want to have us all wait for that blast hit to come back. Now this is E. coli, so with E. coli you get more blast hits than, than you can deal with, so it becomes very difficult. If you have an organism that has a reasonable representation in the database, this approach works pretty well, where I can blast through the database and kind of figure out, oh, this hit 100% you know, match to this strain of E. coli, and here is the genome coordinate position. Um, for organisms that aren't represented as well as E. coli, there may be several, some genes that you can do this. Um, so you just take the best blast hit, and I blast one side of the gap, and I blast the other side of the gap, and I try to look, can I find, does it hit the same reference genome or reference sequence in the same kind of coordinate? And can I get a piece from this reference coordinate and splice it into my gap? And so we can see with this particular blast hit, Now I know that font is really tiny, so maybe you can't see, but uh, there is multiple hits on this E. coli genome that are all 100%. And that's really common in um, de novo assemblies that the edges of contigs fall into some kind of a repetitive element. And so when you blast it and it hits the same genome multiple places at 100%, that's a definite hit on a repetitive element of some sort. And so what I did in this case is I downloaded this reference genome, and I downloaded it into our Seek Builder module, which is our module that gives us a really nice interface for just looking at the sequences and um, looking at the annotations. And I did a edit, go to position, and I typed in that position. And you can see that it hits on insertion INS, and I can double click here, and it brings that feature up into my feature list in Seek Builder. So I can see that this is a transposon. No, no big surprise here. So an IS element, and there's one right next to it. So when I blast the other part of the gap, it falls in INSF. So we have two of them next to each other. So that, that can be kind of tricky. Um, so I'm thinking that maybe you know this sequence range can plug the gap between the two contigs that I'm looking at. And of course, we'll do the gap closure, and we can also confirm at the end. I can splice it together, realign all my data, and if I made an accurate splice, I should see uninterrupted sequence coverage through the splice sites. And, and that's how I can confirm any splice that I do. So I'm going to take this sequence and just do an edit copy and paste it into a new window and save this as a possible splice sequence, and I call it INSE and INSF. Okay, so that's how I take a, again, this could have, this, this fragment could have been generated from PCR amplicons, 
you know, a number of different ways you can deduce what these fragments can be. Um, now to introduce this into the project, I unlock the two contigs I want to join. I'm going to do a sequence add. And here's my sequence that I want to add. And I can use the algorithm within SeekMan now to assemble this one fragment to the two available contigs that I've unlocked. Now if I forget to unlock, in this particular case, I'm going to have a big problem because I guarantee you many other contigs in this project match with these insertion elements. And this could go you know, multiple wrong places. So this is a great example of why you have to lock everything down. I can click Assemble. And, and this takes a little bit of time. So if people have questions at this point, we'll, we'll let this assemble in. And I don't know if Katie has. OK. It just takes a few seconds, but we'll let it, we'll let it run here. So SeekMan has its own. Uh, so I can comment on SeekMan Engine is our next gen assembler. SeekMan Pro has its own algorithms for aligning. So it is a genome finishing type algorithms. Um, it was originally designed for aligning things like uh, ABI chromatogram data. And it's almost done here. And so right now it's just splicing together, and we can look at the project report to see exactly exactly what it did. But And, and so this gap closure process, this is something that, you know, it takes some time. You know, you have to blast, you have to look at each side of the gap. And so there's a manual, this manual intervention and series of steps. So that's why it's very, you know, important before you start gap closure, you want to really uh, investigate to see, do you have a reference genome that's close? And, um, and how many contexts does that produce? And compare that to the genome assembly. And, and really, you can equate number of gaps to the amount of time it's going to take to close your genome. And it's pretty reasonable, you know, between a half hour to an hour per gap of someone's time to do that closure. So um, you want as few of cont as contigs as possible. Okay, so it looks like it's finished up there. And so this is the project report, and it's uh, it keeps a log of, of, of what we've done with the assembly, and we can see We've entered our, our sequence, our gap filling, and it actually matched contig 19 100%. And then it merged with contig 38. The match was a little lower at 88%, but it met our threshold for this algorithm, which is 80%. It takes about a minute 44 to assemble. And so what's happened now is uh, now we have one contig instead of two. And it's, uh, I didn't mention the size before, but it merged those contigs together with our splice piece. And we can go and look at the splice piece, or I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So here's contig 19. So we can go in the strategy view. Let's see. Oops, wrong click there. And zoom in a little bit more. OK. And I'm just going to go to the spot where our splice occurred. There you can see, um, we have, I'm looking at this coverage map, and we have that little area of no coverage. And I'll do a couple more clicks here for you. And so the strategy view then becomes a nice working tool as well. It shows us contig 19 now. Here's our insertion sequence. With this, it was reverse complemented. It's our arrow here, and then we have all the sequence reads in this area. We also create a feature, a join feature, and so this is showing us the two contigs that we joined together, our splice piece where there's no coverage, and then of course I want to go and look at the edges here, and so I can look at the assembly. and In lower case is our insertion sequence that we've added, and I'm just kind of looking to how well does that really match up? You know, I know it was 88 percent. And it matches up well. I don't see a lot of red mismatch. So I can verify on both sides. 
um, just visually. And then, of course, what I want to do is I'm going to take this sequence and I'm going to go to Contig, save the consensus into a single file, and I'm going to use that consensus as a reference sequence for all of this data. I'm going to take my on torrent data, align it back, and look at that splice junction. And if I get nice even coverage without a lot of mismatch, then I know that I've actually accurately spliced those two contigs together. So that's you know gap closure. Uh, I, I skipped through some of the steps. You know, creating the scaffolds. Um, if you don't have mate pair data, um, it's going to be more challenging. We can certainly do it um, using different techniques. Um, but in Seekman, once you once you uh, have your contigs in, and you can cr create a scaffold and positional information, it's important. Lock everything down so you don't misjoin. Focus on one gap at a time. Bring a sequence in by adding it, and then let the algorithm assemble it in. There are other ways, again, to close gaps. There's manual joining, forced joining. Um, I do have an hour-long webinar just on that topic that you can refer to for some more of those steps. So let's switch gears now. So that's, I don't think we have any more questions at this point. Um, maybe at the end of the webinar I can answer more questions, and I'm going to show a targeted resequencing workflow. So we'll launch Seekman Engine. Now we'll pick this different workflow. And you can see when we pick targeted resequencing, we only have one option for assembly type. It's going to be a BAM file, unlimited in size. And this will be an AmpliSeq panel. And we'll pick our output. Let's see here. This is it targeted resequencing. Now, the hardware for a templated assembly is different than de novo. De novo assembly, RAM is the, that's the, really the only critical requirement. For reference guided assemblies, uh, you, you need to make sure to have enough space for temporary files. If you're aligning to just a, a set of FASTA sequences, um, really your, your C drive is going to have more than enough space. Uh, many of our customers, though, choose to align to you know, whole human genomes. You want to have DB SNP information and genomic coordinates. Um, when you start aligning to whole human genomes, uh, you'll want to make sure that wherever your temporary files go, there's plenty of space. And for um, ion torrent AmpliSeq, you know, I would probably recommend a terabyte disk dedicated for these scratch files, something in that range. Um, if you have much larger data sets, you know, whole exomes, um, you may need a couple terabytes of space. For small projects, again, whatever's on your C drive will be more than enough. Uh, there's a link here to our website. I won't go there right now. But um, template files, uh, again, it can be a set of FASTA sequences, but most people will choose a genome template package. And there's some advantages. So if you're working with m the main model organisms, um, DNA Star creates these packages. And here's a human package. And you can also download those from our website. And so these genome template packages contain um, updated DB SNP information. So for human, all 60 million SNPs, Cosmic Cancer Database, and the GURP Evolutionary Rate Profiling Database um, in these packages. We bundle the database information with the annotated GenBank um, files. Again, it's for a number of the model organisms. So these are free for you to download. Pick our platform. And then we're going to grab some data. And so here's a FASTQ file. And I have three different samples. And so if you uh, want to align multiple samples at one time, you can do so with Seekman Engine. Select Multiplex Data. Um, Ion Torrent data will be demultiplexed. So if you have, if you're, if you're getting this sort of data, make sure that whoever is running the, uh, the instrument um, checks their option to demultiplex the, the data for you. And that's always the best. So occasionally a customer will have their data that has not been demultiplexed. Um, you always want to do that right at the sequencing machine, because at the sequencing machine they know exactly what the barcodes are, what the samples are, and that's the best place to do it. So it's, if you do it downstream, oftentimes there can be errors. You don't, 
quite get the right barcodes or you know other problems. So you always want to um, do this up front. Um, in our software, we can then define the sample names. Um, this is actually going to change a bit in our next update later this year, where there will be some automation to this. We'll look at the file name and just automatically assign group names. Um, right now it's manual. Um, so we can set up. Now the capacity here uh, depends on a couple of different things. There's an outright data capacity. You know, C command engine cannot handle you know, five whole human genomes at 100x coverage. You know, if you've got really big data sets, multiple whole human genomes, you'll want to do each one separately. We have analysis software that, that can then do the analysis on the combined projects. Um, for smaller projects like this cancer panel, you know, we can handle um, as many samples until uh, the depth of coverage becomes unmanageable, for instance. So you know, if the depth of coverage is 500x for each sample, um, once you get around 100,000x, it becomes unwieldy to have data sets that are at extreme depths of coverage. So you know, depending on the metrics of your assembly, um, there's different limitations, but the overall message is that the capacity is tremendously large with these BAM files. And typically, you can throw a lot of samples into, into one assembly. So we'll, we'll just uh, look at some assembly options here. Again, with Ion Torrent, um, we've run hundreds of assemblies. Um, so you can stick with the fault as a starting point. Um, there is some SNP calling uh, differences, though, between depending on your genome ploidy, whether you have a haploid or a diploid, or a population of cells, like cancer cells. Um, if I stick with diploid, I'm just going to show you some advanced options for SNP calling. Uh, the Bayesian SNP um, caller that uh, assigns the p-values is going to expect kind of diploid ratios for genotyping. And it will apply some minimal thresholding on, on SNPs to remove noise from the assemblies. And so that SNP percentages at 5% or lower, those SNPs will be filtered out. If you're looking for rare SNPs, you don't want to use diploid. You want to use a population. And if I choose population, look at my options, it's going to use a simple percentage. We've got all sorts of filters that we can apply downstream to separate noise from signal. And there still is this minimum percentage, but I can re remove that completely. So if you're looking for SNPs at 1% or less than 1%, you go to simple percentage and remove the minimum filter, and you'll get all the SNPs in the project. And all the sequencing errors, but that's, you know, that allows you to make that decision. Uh, when we click Next, you can see that with these templated assemblies, there's fewer options here. We're ready to assemble. And again, we, we, we let it start. I watch my task manager. And the difference now is that uh, the templated assembler will be called XNG um, in this list of programs. And so there it's showing up. And it will use a combination of CPU and processing power and RAM. And so right now, uh, this is an eight-core machine. It will use up to 99% of the cores. And so even a webinar like this might have some troubles once the, so the, the, the program uses that much of the hardware resource. Um, and it's, it, it does that initially in the assembly. It will settle down a little bit later on in the assembly so you can do things like webinars and emails uh, on that computer. But generally when you're running these templated assemblies, that computer is at least dedicated for the first half hour or so to running that assembly as fast as it possibly can. Um, again, when this is done, and I don't want that to happen during our webinar, so I'm going to end that process. And now it says we didn't finish. Uh, when this is done, we can launch the, pro the, the project in Seekman Pro. And what I have here, again, my list of contigs now. Um, correspond to chromosomes. Here's human chromosome 1. You see it's 250 megabases, the number of sequences that have aligned. So this cancer panel, of course, targets different exons and different genes on many different chromosomes. And so we have not all the chromosomes, but most of them. And we get an idea of how many sequences aligned here. And you can see which targets have the most sequences. And I can run reports now, a SNP report, for the entire project. If I click the header, and then go to SNP report, I'll get this SNP report generated. And the SNP report really becomes the place where we do most of our analysis. At the top of the SNP report are filters. 
and the rows, each row represents a different variant in the assembly. We get a total number here. There's 570 columns, and then we get uh, or rows, excuse me, and then we have columns of information. And so I can apply filters. For instance, I can say, show me all the SNPs that are in DB SNP that are in the SNP report. And if they're in DB SNP, they will have a DB SNP RS number. So here's the R list of SNPs with RS numbers. I can go open DB SNP, and it will bring me to that RS number for that particular SNP where I can get all the information and allelic frequencies and other information about that SNP. Um, I can also say, show me all the novel SNPs. So here's SNPs that do not have a DB SNP RS number. And the SNP report is interactive, so I can double click. It will bring me to that point in the assembly. And the assembly, if I collapse everything, we have a reference genome sequence with the annotations. Here's my three samples. What's highlighted in yellow is a pseudo consensus. And the variant base is highlighted blue, so I can see that variant. And I can quickly see which of my samples have the variant, which do not. If I want to look at the aligned data, I can expand the assembly, look at the aligned data. And so what you'll want to do is apply different filters then to try to differentiate between what might be noise or what looks like a real uh, SNP signal. So I'll go back to, so I applied a few filters here, minimum occurrence of 5% to a maximum of 100, depth of 50, this is a really deep assembly, and I'm showing coding SNPs only, there can be coding change SNPs only. So with a SNP analysis in SeqMan, we can um, verify SNPs, look at the assemblies, you know, look at those areas, you know, in the project. Um, and, and try to verify the SNPs. Um, if I want to compare between samples, so if I've got um, 10 samples or 100 samples, and I want to answer questions like, you know, which SNPs are um, unique to one sample, or which SNP is common to all samples, or if I have a control and experimental, um, we can we have another piece of software that can do that sort of work, and that's in our ArrayStar. I'll just launch a new instance here of ArrayStar. And so ArrayStar really has evolved from originally microarray analysis data, um, then to RNA-seq analysis um, software, and it's, it's progressed to things like SNP analysis. So it can take data that's in large tables, so SNP information, you know, where you could have millions of data points, you know, millions of SNPs per exome, and you want to compare them at those large scales. Um, ArrayStar has the infrastructure to bring in that data and make statistical comparisons and allow you to filter to find subsets of interest. So the way that we do that sort of analysis is we can just start a SNP project and add a SeqMan engine assembly folder. And so this is a .assembly BAM file. And so I can go and grab my project, targeted resequencing, Ampliseq Cancer Panel, and I can load this project in. And so it will take all those data points then and set up my experiments. And now I've, I've already done, done this with, so that's how you bring the project in. And it will look like this, where we have, here's our three sets, and we have a SNP table, and so the SNP table now in ArrayStar is actually more of a summary, and what it's showing me is here's my, my contig number, my chromosome, my reference position, the gene name, it's giving me the reference sequence, and then, so each row then represents all the SNPs at a position, rather than a separate row per variant. So if I know what gene I'm looking at, um, I could, you know, make a comparison, you know, across you know, these KRAS, and quickly see, do all my samples have the same SNP or not? So it becomes a nice way to summarize and look at genes of interest and, and extract that information a little bit more quickly. Um, of course, you may have larger data sets where you need to apply some filters to find 
the subsets of SNPs of interest. And so that's where ArrayStar gives us some more advanced filtering. And I'll just show just a way, the way that it a filter here. I can filter at the gene level or the SNP level. So I might not care exactly where the SNP is, but I might care that it's in genes and that when I choose the criteria that it's a SNP that introduces a frame shift or a no stop or a nonsense. So I could get a set of genes where SNPs that cause these sort of mutations are occurring. So that's one level of, of searching. Or I can search at a SNP level and then set up filters or sets for each of my individuals. So one example of the way to do this is to say, let's create a set just for one, this FOS 214 sample, and I can choose criteria. And so the ArrayStar criteria has great detail, so I can have exactly the type of SNP. It can be SNP or Indel or both, any type of genotype, and I can set the subclass of SNPs, and I can apply filters. Okay, and this is something that you just experiment with, and then you just do a search, and it's finding 31 SNPs in the sample that meet that criteria. I can save this as a set, and once you start creating sets, that's when we can start comparing sets to each other. So again, it might be control versus experimental, control versus disease, multiple samples. We can associate um, different variants then with different conditions or different samples. And so once I start making these, com uh, these sets, I'll have a set list, and these are all set lists that, I, that I've created, and I can make comparisons then between the sets, you know, and run things like Venn diagrams, and so I can look at SNPs that are uncommon between my groups or unique to each group. And there are some quick links then where I can switch over again from SNP level analysis over to gene level analysis or look at just that subset of SNPs of interest. So it's a really nice tool to take very, very large data sets, apply some pretty easy to use filters, and find um, variants of interest. And so this is kind of scratching the surface on ArrayStar. There's, there's you know, different things that we can do as well with regards to bringing in annotations. So I can import annotations. So if you have VCF files that contain more information about variants, uh, we can bring those in as well and populate you know, more information in our SNP, SNP table and columns. So here's a VCF file from the Exome Variant Database. So I could bring in those sorts of files into ArrayStar to continue with the analysis. Now there's some additional uh, webinars, and I will just jump back up to our website. So if you go under the support section, um, you can see there's today's webinar, and then just look in the, the past webinars that we've done, um, we have a uh, Here's our genome assembly and gap closure from January 30th, our automated bacterial genome closure back in December 5th. Um, there's an RNA-seq webinar from October. And then what we're covering now with the RayStar and looking for variants, uh, that was a webinar that was done uh, last year, and I believe it's uh, this from June 27th. We go into detail again and spend a little bit more time looking at a multiple exome data set and finding interesting variants using both Seekman Pro and ArrayStar. Um, so uh, certainly, you know, take a look at these webinars. Um, if we didn't cover exactly the workflow that, that you're looking for, we also have videos that are some, some basic things like cloning and gene detection to um, next-gen workflows. You can see some of these are platform-specific. We have a number of ion torrent workflows for a number of different ion torrent work, uh, uh, data sets, and these are just several minutes long. So again, these are great resources to see what the capability are, is with the software and, uh, and really give you a feel for how powerful the software is. So I guess we just have a couple of minutes left here. Um, I will take any questions that folks might have, and, uh, and if, if we don't get to you right now, um, I'll get, uh, answer you through email uh, later today and tomorrow. So thank you again for your time. and. We do have one question, and if, if there are other questions, please chat them in in these last couple minutes. Um, Matt, you started to talk a little bit about confirming SNPs in SeekMan Pro. 
How do you export that confirmed SNP data, and also can you export your consensus um, in a way that reflects what SNPs are confirmed and which are still putative or which are rejected? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So there's there's a number of ways to uh, confirm SNPs. Um, one way we can confirm a SNP and then um, save it as a user SNP. It's just it's under the SNP uh, menu item, and what that does is it creates a custom SNP file, and that custom SNP file, I'll, I'll show you what one looks like here. So if we go back to our Genom template package and open the DB SNP files, you see these are all. This is all the SNP information for DB SNP. If you verify your own SNPs in Seekman and save them, this data.other file is written, and the data.other file um, contains uh, so. If you open this on a spreadsheet, it's a little clear, but it tells me which contig, the reference position, the DB SNP ID, and a user SNP ID. And so this is a way we can start building our own, not for our novel SNPs, we can start building our own custom SNP database this way. And so that's only available if you use a Genom template package. If you have a project where you don't have a Genom template package, you're using some uh, organism or a FASTA file, Seekman will prompt you to create your own, a new novel genome template package from your reference sequence. And so this is the best way to curate your SNPs. Now if you if you have a consensus sequence, you can also export a consensus out, and when you export the consensus out, you're given the option, there's a checkbox for an unforced con consensus. So the way Seekman works is that when there's a marked reference sequence present, anytime you export the consensus, it'll be the forced sequence which is the same as the reference. But if you uncheck that box, Seekman will recompute the consensus, and that consensus then will reflect any of the variants that are in the aligned data. So that, that's a very common question, and again, you know, we can help you with that if it's if it's uh, for your, with your data set. Great, thanks, Matt. I, I don't see any other questions, and it looks like we just have about one minute. So I, I just want to mention before we sign off, Matt showed the webinar page. Uh, Keep an eye on that in the next uh, few weeks. Um, some, later this spring, we're going to be releasing LaserGene 11. Matt alluded to some of the new features uh, in his PowerPoint, um, availability on the cloud, um, viral integration analysis, uh, lots of other new features, um, specifically in the next gen arena, and also protein structure prediction coming with that release later this spring. Um, so once we uh, no more, we will have a webinar to go over all of those new features. So uh, we hope to, to see you at that event. And in addition, we do lots of next-gen webinars throughout the year on various topics, um, as Matt pointed out, some of those. So keep an eye on the webinars page, and you'll also get an email after this webinar with a, a link to that page that includes a recording to today's webinar. So if you missed any part of today's webinar, you can see it there as well. And if you have any questions um, after today's webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us, um, webinars at dnastar.com. Uh, we'll get you in touch with me or support at DNA Star. We'll get you in touch with our technical support staff. So with that, we will sign off, and thanks for joining us. <laughs>